Welcome to another episode of the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Thanks for downloading this episode of the podcast. Today, our guest is Jeff Friday, the founder of the American Black Film Festival and one of the most innovative entrepreneurs in the film and television industry today. Recognized as the leading film festival of its kind, ABFF remains the premier platform that introduces filmmakers of color to the industry and has created opportunities for people of color outside of Hollywood's doors by helping them find their inroad. Jeff is a successful producer of several live events. He has financed numerous independent films, created and executive produced television specials, and produced a featured documentary called Storm Over Brooklyn for HBO in partnership with Emmy and Oscar-winning production company Lightbox. Jeff currently serves as the CEO of ABFF Ventures LLC, a multifaceted company specializing in the production of live events, television, and films focused on African-American culture. Before we get to our interview, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member, please consider joining Film Florida at filmflorida.org. Don't forget, we have a Film Florida merchandise page. Visit teespring.com slash stores slash Film Florida to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, and protective masks. Now here's my conversation with Jeff Friday. Thanks for joining us on the Film Floor Podcast, Jeff. Great to be here, John. So I'd like to start with your backstory. Tell our audience about yourself. I'll take you back to 1997 to make it all make sense. I was working as the president of an advertising agency in New York City, and I took my first trip to the Sundance Film Festival in 1997. And I always wondered where do indie filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino and Steve Steven Soderbergh, and if you remember back that far, there's a film that Steven Soderbergh had called Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Of course. And that film, I think, premiered in, in 1996 at Sundance. And I didn't really understand the market. You know, I was a big fan of film. I was, in the, I was an ad exec, but I didn't understand the movie business, really. And when I went there, I understood it. it you know, festivals are markets for independent artists. And I was very inspired by my first experience at Sundance. But what I did not see uh, is what drove me to create the American Black Film Festival. I did not see a ton of diversity. It was primarily white males. There wasn't a lot of women, very few people of color. And I just asked myself, and again, being an advertiser, you always challenge your senses. And you always try to ask, is there a market for something? That's kind of the core of advertising, right? Understanding audiences and market opportunities. And I asked myself, is, is there a market for black and brown filmmakers? Are there movies out here that speak to their community? And was major fe festivals like Sundance in Toronto, which were the major ones at the time, were they really doing enough to outreach to diverse communities? And not knowing the answer and, and knowing that I would never find that true answer. And, you know, and, and my philosophy is if you see something you don't like, change, you know, do something about it. I created the American Black Film Festival that year. So I came back to New York. I sat with my boss and I said, hey, I got an idea. And he supported it. And he funded the very first one. And our very first festival was in Acapulco, Mexico. The Mexican government office of tourism was one of our largest advertising clients at the time. And we pitched them on this international f festivals f focused on black and brown content. And so that was the start, 1997. About four months after a trip to Sundance, we decided to launch the very first American Black Film Festival in Mexico. And since that time, your focus has been on ABFF, and you've built it into being one of the leading film festivals of its kind. ABFF is the premier platform that introduces filmmakers of color to the industry and has created opportunities for people of color outside of Hollywood by helping them find their inroad. For those that aren't as familiar with ABFF, get in the weeds a little bit. Tell us a little bit about the film festival, uh, you know, at, at a high level. So, like I said, it started in 1997. In the very first year, 90 people showed up in Acapulco. And while it wasn't a tremendous success from an audience standpoint, we, we were able to find 14 filmmakers that we didn't know existed. So we played 14 indie movies by Black okay. directors. And while not many people showed up for the very first one, I realized by the end of the week that there was a need for this. People who attended had an emotional response 
to being there, to creating this captive environment where Black artists felt supported. In fact, our very first Rising Star recipient was Halle Berry. So in wow. 1997, we found this young actress who not many people knew named Halle Berry, and we presented her with our Rising Star Award. At, at the end of every festival, we give out awards. And then in 2011, there was this young director that not many people knew called Ryan Coogler, who directed Black Panther, and we mm -hmm. gave him our top emerging director award. So you ask me for top level, what it's really about is finding Black voices, Halle Berry's in front of, Ryan Coogler's behind the camera, and using the festival as a vehicle to spotlight and uplift those voices, to find gems and people and not only find them, they might be out there, but we bring them to the forefront. There are a lot of people working that are great, but who's pushing them to the front of the line? And that's really what our festival has been about. And people like Will Packer, you know, Will Packer might not be a household name, but he's a, he's a super uber producer who's produced Girls Trip and Ride Along with Kevin Hart. He's probably got a billion dollars in the box office. He was a young kid when he came through as well. So when people ask us what our legacy is, it is we have been a pipeline for African-American, primarily African-American talent in front of and behind the camera. And what happens is those people get job opportunities. They end up impacting and influencing the greater community because we've given them a chance. So 25 years later, and we've got hundreds of examples of people who have come through our festival and are now working, but 25 years later, that's really, uh, John, what our legacy is about. Leveling the, play, leveling the playing field for, you know, for minority black and brown artists. And the slogan on your website says at the forefront of diversity in Hollywood since 1997, as we've been talking about, but it's not just the slogan. It is actually true as you're talking about. So uh, talk about how the film festival has evolved from those early days in Mexico to where it is today. You know, in terms of our evolution, one of the smartest moves that we made was to leave Mexico. And with all due respect to my friends in Acapulco, we, we were not getting the numbers in terms of attendees and the public awareness in terms of media that we needed. We were doing great things, and, you know, Halle Berry honored and Morgan Freeman and big stars like that, and people were coming, but the world didn't really know about it because Acapulco is not a major media market. Right. And so in 2002, we decided with the support of the uh, GMCBB, the Greater Miami Convention uh, Business and Convention Bureau, we decided to relocate to Miami Beach. And I would just say, in terms of the evolution, there are a lot of things that have happened strategically that have helped support this, this thing that we built. But that was one of the key things uh, to, to coming to Miami. You know, as, as you well know, infrastructure is fantastic. We've got a multicultural audience already there, you know, great hotels, convention infrastructure, theaters. So in terms of raising the, the profile of the festival itself, coming to Miami was probably one of the smartest things we've done. The other thing we've done strategically, in, you know, in addition to building out the festival and, and grounding it you know, in South Florida, we've created spinoff events now. So what started in 1997 as a single event is now a pretty substantial events company. And all of our events have the same DNA, supporting black talent. So. In 2016, we launched an award show called ABFF Honors, and that's held in Beverly Hills every year. And if I had to describe it, I would just say it's the Black version of the Golden Globes. You know, big stars, glitzy night, champagne at the tables, it's that kind of thing. And that's really about celebrating those artists who have already made it, like Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman and people like that. And then two years ago, we launched ABFF London. So in addition to our festival in Miami, we have a sister festival in the UK. And what we found is that we have audiences around the world, but everyone can't get to Miami a year. So, you know, that festival just started in 2019, and I predict in four or five years, it'll be as large as our, as our festival in Miami. And lastly, we're launching in June of this year, ABFF Comedy Festival, which is an alternative to the Montreal Just for Laughs Festival. And our kind of secret sauce is find something that exists in the world that needs to be more diverse, and we create an alternative to it. And we don't disparage the thing that inspired us. You know, we acknowledge what inspired us, but we just create a version that really does, you know, 365 days a year support our audience. 
and, and we try to make it as inclusive as possible. So now what was started from a trip to Sundance in 1997 in a, in a festival like Foco is this company now or this brand called ABFF that has a much broader universe of, of events and experiences that all celebrate Black people in, in film and television. And now you recently just announced the plans for ABFF 2021 in Miami Beach. Tell us what the plan is. Yes, super excited about that. Uh, our 25th anniversary will be held November 3rd through the 7th back in South Beach. And we, and we missed it last year because of COVID. We had a virtual event in 2020, uh, which was very successful, but it certainly was no comparison to being on Collins Avenue. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and Lincoln Road. So, uh, yeah, very much looking forward to that. We just opened submissions recently, a uh, call for submissions in a ton of categories, and we have about $50,000 in cash prizes for filmmakers. So I'm very excited to be back uh, in the city of Miami Beach with the support of the mayor's office and, and the GMCBB and all of our friends and colleagues there as well. Excellent. And, and we're looking forward to having you back after the hiatus of 2020. Yes, um, so ABFF is your main focus, as we've been talking about, but you're also a filmmaker. Tell us about that. Yes. A year ago, I launched a production company called Jeff Friday Media. We were very fortunate because we sold our first project. I think we were like, uh, I think we were six weeks into the launch of the company. And we came upon a, a documentary called Yusef Hawkins Storm Over Brooklyn. And it happened to be directed by one of my alumni filmmakers from the festival, Muta Ali. And we sold that project to HBO. So six weeks into a production company, we sold our first project, which is great. Wow. It premiered on HBO Max this past August. And we recently just sold our second project. Unfortunately, I can't announce the title yet, but it'll, it'll come out soon to HBO as well. So in, in forming a company, we realized that the, the festival, it's a great pipeline to bring the people to the forefront, but we were not getting them to production. So, you know, we were helping people get awareness, but we didn't have a vehicle or mechanism to create new content. And it took a long time to, to kind of get it going. But after 20, you know, plus years, we, you know, Jeff, so we, now we've got three or four projects already in the works and, and, and we'll have this full-fledged production company running alongside this event company. And it, and it just kind of feed each other now. So it's kind of a great, great place to be. And, you know, your bio talks about one of your roles as a film financier, and that's probably the most uh, often question I get in my role is how do I get my project financed? So just generally speaking, what advice do you have for people looking for financing for their projects? The, the advice I would give for people looking for financing is to have your package together. I, I get scripts all the time. And I've probably invested or loaned, you know, I, I've been in support of young people for a long time, maybe 40 films over the, you know, 20 years. And the ones that I've invested in are the ones that were fully thrown out. Like, for example, as an investor, you're not just looking at a script. You're looking at the plan for me to make my money back or a plan to get to profit. And I just think that film, my advice to filmmakers is, is you have to be filmmakers, but also have a business plan. You know, I don't know if very many people that will invest in a movie based on just based on the creative aspects of it all. Understanding the distribution outlets for your movie, having comps. So if you got a movie about a guy who meets a girl on a bicycle, you know, and, and it's in Miami, then you got to have some comps to, to make predictions, knowing who you're going to sell, knowing how festivals fit into your to your sales plan. And then having a firm return on investment, you know, so I, I think the filmmakers got to think more like it's more like entrepreneurs, because a movie, as you well know, is, is a business, you know, and it could be very profitable. Business. Unfortunately, most of them missed the hit. But that's us. There's no magic. The, the other thing is networking. You know, if you don't have people in your network who have the resources to invest in movies, then you got to expand your network. You know, unfortunately, some people have networks that include wealthy, well hilled people interested in that. But most of us don't. I personally was not one who was fortunate enough to know people and, you know, had money to invest in movies. You just have to build that, you have to build that network around. Jeff, you're obviously an advocate for diversity in our industry and for Film Florida, um, diversity in, in our membership and, and honestly in our everyday operations is an important initiative that we have for 2021. Talk about 
the importance of diversity in the film and television industry on, on a global sense? Yeah, I, I was very pleased because the watershed moment really was with the Oscars, hashtag Oscars so white. And I was very pleased when that happened. But unlike most people who were focused on the creative aspects of what that meant, that there were no black nominees for any awards, that wasn't really where the diversity needs to happen the most, in my opinion. We're, we're often focused on the actors, you know, the creatives. Right. But anyone who knows how this business works knows that the decisions about what we see are not done by actors. It's done by what I call the, the not so diverse bucket of green lighters. Right. Right. And so what we're fighting for and want to see more of is more diversity at the executive levels. For example, I'm a producer and, and I go into a network and I pitch a project about the black experience. If no one in that room relates to what I'm talking about, if they only read it in the book or a piece of paper, then it's very difficult to sell a movie to people. Who, and it's not about racism. This is just about ignorance or not knowing. There, there are a lot of cultural experiences that exist in our world that I know nothing about. Right. I'll be the first. And I would recuse myself. I'd say, you know, I'm not the expert in this. I'll bring somebody in the room who is. And that doesn't happen enough. So when you walk into a room and it's 75% of the time, you're looking at white males between 45 and 65 who are making all decisions about what we see as a, as a global audience. You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to know that that's off, you know. And I always say diversity is good business. Forget what your political social views about your business. <laughs> your business commitment should be, you know, if you work for that chairman or you and the chairman works for the board, your business commitment should be to make as much money as you can if you're running a company and to do it in the most ethical way. Right. And so this whole issue of systemic oppression is really what what really bothers me most. So, yes. The browning and blackening of, of nominees for the Oscars is important, but it is nowhere near as important as having diversity in executive positions in film and television and with organizations like Film Florida and others. So you, you really do have to think about, you know, I wouldn't spend too much time, John, honestly, on how do we get here? I think a lot of a lot of organizations go, how do we get here? I think everyone knows how we got here. <laughs> I say, right. you know, how do we get here? Yes, this, this is America. Where do we want to go? And you know what I hear too often? Oh, I know we can do better. If I hear that one, my head's going to explode. You know, oh, I know we can do better. No, stop saying it. Yes, you can do better. What's our action plan to do better? And how are we going to keep ourselves honest? And the good news is I truly, I'm an eternal optimist. And I just think that, you know, five years from, it's already changed. You know, the world's changed already. And, and I think five years from now, we might be in a place where there's a lot more equity in our in our industry in front of and behind the camera. Well, that was going to be my next question is it seems like we've as an industry, we've made a lot of uh, strides, you know, recently, depending on, on how you look at it. But are you optimistic that this momentum continues? Yeah. As long as we don't satisfy ourselves with giving black and brown people and women awards, because I, I think that I, my fear is that will say so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so won a Golden Globe and there were black, there were seven Golden Globe winners this year that, that were people of color, right? And we're doing great now. I think that's our fear. That just kind of like, yeah. we can't get satisfied with the wrong kinds of things, I think. You know, I think we have to look at these media companies and say, we've got representation of diverse voices at the decision-making level. And then what will happen is the future of our industry will be very different than what it is now. Yeah. And to your point, the easy part is getting stuff where everybody can see in front of the screen. It's the behind the scenes stuff that is more long lasting and more sustainable. You know, anybody can can give an award to somebody and say, look, look what we did and pat ourselves on the back. It's the yeah. long term stuff behind the scenes that will truly make the difference. The long term change in our in our business. Yeah. And I think we got also have to figure out, you know, how we create pipelines for new talent. As executives, I remember, you know, when I graduated from uh, business school in the late 80s or in the early 90s, I couldn't figure out how to get a Hollywood job. I wanted to be a studio executive. I've, I've got such a bizarre path to this because it's been from the outside, the whole thing, right? I've been kind of walking along the outside of the rim of Hollywood trying to figure out how to get in. And you get in 20 whatever years later, but 
I couldn't figure out, you know, because I didn't know anyone in Hollywood, I couldn't figure out what degree I needed or what experience I had to have to, to become the head of marketing for a studio. And I still don't, to be honest with you, but mm -hmm. that's not my aspiration now, obviously. But I just think we've got to make it, we got to de demystify Hollywood a bit for people who aspire to do it. This is, there's still this velvet rope mentality where, you know, if you, you know, you haven't been to a nightclub and somewhere they got this bouncer outside with this velvet rope around the door and you know, he's only letting in people that he knows. That's kind of how Hollywood works, if we're being honest with ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. you know, people let in people. There's no degree you get, you know, you don't have to be a 4.0 at Stanford to get a job here. You know, it's it's kind of like people pick and choose from people they're related to or doing deals with. They all become the same person. And, right. and, and that's how we got here. The velvet rope mentality is really in and, and nepotism, to be very frank. That's how mm -hmm. we got here. And only doing business with people that you know and look like you or, or hang out at the same country clubs. It's the country club mentality. That's really what's progressive here. And so how do we get people who don't know anyone in Hollywood? That's really where the growth is, right? How do you get young, a Latino boy who grew up in, in the Bronx in New York who wants to be a, who, who wants to help moving? How does he get here, right? And so I think these pipeline programs, maybe with universities that focus on diverse populations might be good. There's a lot of, like, there's a, so much work to fix Hollywood. Uh, and I think Hollywood has a responsibility because if you ask yourself, what does America do best? I don't know that we're the leader in technology anymore. I don't think we're the leader in healthcare. If you look at our, how successful we are compared to some other countries, you know, in education, I don't know. You know, I'm not, I won't, you know, disparage our country, but I'm not sure if we're clearly the leader in these things. But what we're clearly the leader in is entertainment. It's the manufacturing of entertainment. Yes. There's no doubt about that. And for industry that we're clearly the number one in the world at, we've got to do a better job at representation in that industry. And, and I am hopeful, uh, guardedly, cautiously optimistic that uh, things are going to continue to get better. So, Jeff, tell people where they can go to learn more and follow uh, the American Black Film Festival and all of your endeavors. People interested in finding out more about our company in general and the American Black Film Festival or the ABF Comedy Fest can go to uh, our website, abff.com. And again, our festival is coming up. Our 25th annual American Black Film Festival is coming up. We'll be back to Miami Beach uh, this November, November 3rd through the 7th, 2021. And uh, we're very, very excited to be with you guys and to be a part of the South Florida community. Thanks for being with us today on the Film Florida podcast, Jeff. I really appreciate you taking the time and talking about some issues that, that we don't get to, a chance to talk about very often, but we really need to. Awesome. It's my pleasure. And I'll be back anytime you invite me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Film Florida podcast. For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out the Film Florida merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash film Florida. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.